gallows, war, heroin, and a hero. Today on the Bible in one year with the preacher's husband. Today we're going through the book of Esther chapter 6 through 10 to finish it up. And as we're doing this chronologically, we're going to jump over to Ezra chapter 7 through chapter 10 tomorrow. So let's get back to our story. Now, yesterday we left off with Haman building the gallows to hang Mordecai, right? So, that night, the king couldn't sleep very well. He kind of had this insomnia, so to speak. And um, since he couldn't, sp couldn't sleep, he ordered the book recording daily events to be brought to him and read to him. Now, I'm sitting there reading this. I'm thinking, man, he just brought this boring book and had these dudes come read this boring stuff to him so it would bore him to sleep, probably, to cure his insomnia. But as they read, they get to the report of where Mordecai had informed on the eunuchs that actually saved the king's life because he informed about their attempt to kill him. So the king says, well, what kind of honor or special rec recognition have we given to this Mordecai dude? And of course, his attendants was like, uh, pfft, nothing. We didn't do anything for the dude. So the king says, okay, well, who's this in the court that's coming up here to the court? And they said, oh, well, it's Haman. He's there at the court. The king's like, okay, well, just have him come on in. So Haman came in and asked the king. The king asked Haman, said, okay, Haman, what should the king do for a man that the king wants to honor? What should I do to honor somebody that I want to honor? And Haman thinks to himself, man, who in the world could he want to honor Wow, the only person I can think of is me. Maybe he wants to honor me. So he tells this big spiel. He says, look, here's what you probably ought to do. Give him some royal garments that the king himself has worn. Give him a horse that the king has actually ridden and put a crown on his head and parade him around the city square and proclaim that this is what is done for a man that the king wants to honor. So the king said, that is a great idea. Now hurry up and go do that just as you propose and go do that to Mordecai. And I can only imagine the look on Haman's face when he said, go do that for Mordecai. He was probably shocked because he was here to tell the king that he wants to kill Mordecai. Yet here's the king honoring Mordecai. So Haman, oh, probably scared to death here. So he did. He went out and did just as he was told to do and, of course, led him around the streets proclaiming that this man is honored. So when he gets done, he goes home. He tells his wife and all of his friends everything that happened, and they're like, dude, you are doomed, man. You are doomed. So while they're speaking to him, telling him about this doom and gloom, Haman retreats off to the banquet that Esther has prepared for him and the king. So the king and Haman come to this feast together. Now they're drinking wine together, of course, and the king's all drinking it, drinking it and being happy. And he says, listen, Queen Esther, we know you're up to something here. What is it that you want to be given to you? And the queen answers the king and basically says, spare my life and spare my people because I ha all of us have been sold into destruction and death and extermination. And the king's like, what? Who in the world would do such a thing to you and your people? Who would do that? And Esther points across the table and says, right there, the evil Haman has done this. And Haman was terrified when this happened. The king was so ticked off that he jumps up and he leaves. Um, Haman stayed behind to beg the queen for mercy and beg him for his life, really. And when the king comes walking back, because Haman knew that the king had gone to go plan something really terrible for him. So he's begging the queen to intervene for him. And as he leans down to fall down at the queen's feet there, where the queen was laying on this couch, the king walks in right as he goes down on top of the queen to beg. And, and um, the king comes in and sees this happen. He's like, would he actually violate the queen while I'm in the house thinking something different? And as soon as this statement left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face and out he goes. So the eunuch said, you know, there's these gallows out there that are 75 feet tall out at his house that he had made for Mordecai because he was going to kill Mordecai. And the king's like, what? You go hang him on those gallows. So they did. 
Haman was hung on the gallows. That brings us to chapter 8. Now, that very same day, he awarded Esther the estate of Haman. So, Esther is now owns all of Haman's property, and he reve he re um, Esther had revealed her relationship to Mordecai. So she tells the king, "Look, Mordecai here. He's actually my dad, but he's not really my dad. He adopted me. He's actually a cousin that adopted me, took me in as his own. He is." related to me so the king takes his signet ring that he got back from haman and gave it to mordecai and esther put him in charge of haman's estate so now mordecai is in charge of haman's estate and mordecai is being lifted up into the position that haman was before so he is now a leader so esther addressed the king and begged him to revoke all of the evil things that haman had done and proclaimed against the Jews but there was a problem there there was a problem with that idea of rejecting a decree and the king says look now I've given you all this stuff and all this power and all this authority and I've handed you my seal but here's the thing a document that is written in the king's name and sealed with the royal signet cannot be revoked so he basically said i can't revoke that decree that decree is going to happen no matter what it's not going to happen i can't do it so mordecai has the signet ring right so they're thinking okay so what's our next step in this adventure we're going to make another decree so mordecai writes another decree has the royal scribes are all summoned together and they write it in every language and mordecai wrote in the king's name and seals this this edict that basically gave the Jews the right to assemble, defend themselves, to destroy and kill and annihilate every ethnic and provincial army hostile to them, including women and children, and to take their pose take possession of all their spoils of war if they happen to be attacked. So, this gives them a heads up of what's going to come. And they even wrote in there that here's the day it's going to happen. Here's the day you're going to be attacked. You have our authority to defend yourself. Chapter 9. Dun, 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 the day comes. And guess what? On the day when the Jews' enemies had hoped to overpower them, just the opposite happened. The Jews overpowered those who hated them because they were warned, they were expecting it, and it happened. And they won all of those battles that came. So, Mordecai recorded all of these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews in all of the king's provinces, both near and far, and he ordered them to celebrate their victories on the 14th and the 15th days of the month of Adar every year, because during those days, the Jews gained relief from their enemies. And those are still celebrated today, and they're called the Days of Purim. I thought that was super interesting. And then, of course, Queen Esther wrote another letter to confirm with her full authority the letter about Purim that he had written. So Mordecai and the Queen Esther both established this celebration of Purim. Now, we get to chapter 10. The interesting thing about chapter 10 here is it starts out with the king imposing a tax on the land. Now you think, man... This good thing just happened to the Jews. Now he's going to tax them. Well, let's put this into context. If you remember back at the very beginning of Esther, the king actually took away the taxes in celebration of a new queen. So there were no taxes at this point. So what this could be is an example of a reversal of that tax relief that was given when the empire was had started here with the marriage of Esther to um, Xerxes the first, and now since Mordecai the Jew had helped all the, this Gentile king, and there has been brought forth this new prosperity in the land. Now that the the people are being more prosperous, now the king is going to tax them so he can recoup some of the losses since he didn't have any money coming in this whole time. So the king's going to have something to live on, right? At least that's my perspective on it. What's yours? What do you think? And I pose this question to you as well as we get to the end of this. Mordecai as a biblical model of fatherhood. What do you
what do you think about that? Do you think Mordecai was a good father, even though Esther was not his daughter? He did adopt her as his own. Is that not evidence of what we should do? It takes a village to raise a child. Um, is that evidence of a man stepping in to do the duties when another man has not been able to do so? Now, granted, mom and daddy were dead, so there was no. It wasn't that Esther's father had, was a deadbeat dad or anything like that. He wasn't, but she didn't have a father. She didn't have a mother. Where was she going to go as an orphan? He took her in. He brought her in. And during this whole episode in these, these 10 chapters, Mordecai was continually communicating with her and giving her advice. What do you think about Esther as a daughter? Not as a queen, but as a daughter. Did he take? Did she take his advice? Did she follow his advice? Did she think about that? Think about this in terms of an adult father and an adult daughter. Did they model... A good biblical model of what that relationship might look like? I think probably so. What do you think? I hope that this has helped you in your studies. If it has, of course, click the like button, subscribe button, and click the little jingle bell so you can get notified the next time I upload a video. And hit that little boxing glove if you're rumbling with me on Rumble. And we will see you again tomorrow for another episode of the Bible in one year with the preacher's husband.